to St. Thomas's Church. Good morning, good morning, good to see you this morning, or oh, not to see you, but imagine you're there. This was meant to be our last service live stream of the Vicarage, but we've got two more, unfortunately. We start again on August the 1st. August the 1st is the new uh, St. Thomas's Church Freedom Day, so only a couple more. I'm sorry about the delay, but we're almost there. Uh, so let's pray together as we meet in this way for almost the last time. Father, thank you. We can meet via the wonder of technology. We just pray, even though we want to be together, even though we're frustrated, we do thank you for that we can meet in this way. And we pray you bless us today in, uh, through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin in praise to Almighty God. Fantastic song. Well, we're going to hand over, this might be the last time we do this, I hope it's the last time we have to do this, to experiment with the technology and go live to someone else's home. So we're going to go live to Mark, uh, and Letty is going to read in a moment, but let's pray for uh, Mark as he preaches. Father, thank you for the word, your word, that Letty is about to read to us, and we pray you'd uh, help her read that well and help Mark speak the truth well. Uh, even though he's speaking at a camera, may he remember we are listening and may you speak to us through the wonder of technology, through the wonder of your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, if I remember how to press the buttons, I'll go live and hope that we can see Mark. Yes, we can see Mark. Uh, over to you, Mark. God bless. Thank you very much. I love Malachi, and I'm so excited to be able to uh, preach on it today. And before Letty goes to read chapter four, let me... Let me ask you something. Who here is looking forward to Freedom Day on July the 19th? It's been a long time coming, hasn't it? When Britain finally becomes unlocked from so many of the restrictions that have made our lives a living nightmare. Masks become voluntary. Businesses that have been forced closed can now reopen. 
and dozens of other restrictions that made life so hard are being lifted, bring a sense of normality back into our lives. And most importantly, we can finally sing again in church. Are you ready? I certainly am. And this week, for the first time in 55 years, England is at a football final. We wait with bated breath to see what will happen. Will football be coming home tonight? Or will we suffer crushing defeat being so close? Will today be England's day? Are you ready? Well, Malachi 4 talks about a different sort of day. One that is far more significant and far greater than England's moment of glory. Sorry, lads. Or Freedom Day on July 19th. Sorry, Boris. It's a day whose expectation puts both COVID Freedom Day and the Euro 2020 final both to easy shame. Malachi 4 is about the day of the Lord. Are you ready? Letty will now read Malachi chapter 4 for us. Letty. Malachi chapter 4. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer, evildoer will be stubble. And that day is, that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Letty. So throughout the book of Malachi, God deals with those who ignore their present relationship with God and have deluded or persuaded themselves that somehow, some way, they are in the right and are the actual victims, whereas God is clearly in the wrong. God's people instead blame God, and they pile accusations upon him and deny any responsibility. The lists of accusations, there are certain replies of ignorance, deceit, and downright disrespect are rife among God's people in Malachi's time. And as we're about to look at chapter four, we find Malachi, in the middle of dealing with accusations from chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. If you've got a Bible, have a look with me. Well, have a look with me now. It says this, You've said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Well, as we saw last week, the Lord begins to make a distinction between those who think like this and accuse God, the wicked who don't serve God, who don't fear him, and who don't honour his name, and those who do fear the Lord, those who are considered righteous, who do serve God, who do honour his name. Chapter four then deals once and for all what will happen to both groups. The coming of the day of the Lord, God's final word, to all who oppose him and to all who truly love him. Are you ready? And if Ian's ready, my first point is this. The day of the Lord is coming. Future judgment. So to all who challenge God, his name, his character and his justice, the day of the Lord is coming. 
Look with me at verse one. It will burn like a furnace. Have you ever been too close to fire? The intensity of the heat is unpleasant. It hurts. And this fire, you have to excuse the expression, hurts like hell. Well, in fact, it is. Malachi, the final book of the Old Testament, parallels the final book of the New Testament, Revelation. And it says in chapters 20 and 21 of Revelation that anyone whose name is not found in the book of life, known as a scroll, remembrance, Malachi 3, is judged and thrown into the lake of fire, the second death. And it's so all consuming that those prospering evildoers, those so-called blessed arrogant, those who are doing evil so well for a short time, verse, verse one, will be stubble and not a root or branch will be left to them. For a culture heavily relied on agriculture and farming and a people that were led to the promised land of milk and honey, these pictures would have been particularly poignant. Stubble, not what's on my face, but stubble in those times were the useless remains after harvest. And not even a root or a branch be left to them in verse one says a judgment, not a blessed plenty, but a barrenness. It's indeed a bleak picture, particularly when God mentioned in Malachi 3 of storehouses overflowing and a blessed harvest. Those who seem to have gone wealthy or powerful by doing evil, being arrogant and filling their lives full of injustice, all of that will be taken away. All will be stripped down and all will be dealt with. The Lord warns that this will happen. It will be certain, inevitable, final and full of loss. Yet, if we look back at verse three, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, even those who challenge God escape, we find that they do. But it's a terrible fate because they're cut off from the blessing of God and cut off from the Lord himself. These people have therefore a choice when God warns them through Malachi, continue and face the consequences or turn to him. So the day of the Lord comes and the fires of judgment are final. Are you ready? But what about those whose names are written in the scroll of remembrance, in the book of life? What happens to them? Well, chapter four isn't just a warning for those who don't repent and don't fear the Lord and stay in their wicked ways. But it's also hope for those who do fear the Lord. Have a look with me at verses two to three. But for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you'll go out and leap by calves released from the stall. Then you'll trample down the wicked. There'll be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. The Lord is answering this. It's futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out requirements and going around like mourners before the Lord Almighty? The Lord says this. For those who revere God's name, it isn't a fiery furnace. God instead uses another picture of heat and light to convey what will happen. But instead of a consuming furnace, it will be the life-giving sun. A sun that gives hope and healing. A sun that feels warm, pleasantly, where you want to bathe in its rays. The warm rays of spring and summer. Revelation 2 talks about this picture that Malachi brings. The sun, if you look at Revelation 21, is the Lord. It's the glory of God being the light shining down on the people of God, with the Lamb, Jesus, being the lamp 
from which the sun shines. And there'll be healing, as mentioned in Malachi 2. Revelation 21.4 says this, that healing comes from the Lord who will wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And adding to this joyful picture, is God describing his people like calves, leaping out, well-fed calves releasing from the store after months being cooped up? It's a funny image for us, but for those who are full of agriculture and farming, it is a common picture. I YouTubed what calves do when they come out this weekend. When they see grass for the first time in months, they run and literally leap for joy. Their bundles of energy unleashed. It's a bit like a coiled spring, suddenly released. God's people are shown to be joyful and free. The joy of the day of freedom on July the 19th, or the jubilant celebration, if England wins, and I hope they do, will be fantastic, but it also pale in comparison as those things will fade. They don't bring salvation. Whereas this picture, this day of the Lord, is a release of a redeemed people who will see the wicked put in their rightful place. The wicked will be trampled. They'll be turned to ash. It's the end of injustice, oppression, and suffering and evil. Something which no vaccine or trophy can solve. As one theologian puts it, just as the sun drives away darkness and clouds, bring light and joy, so the sun of righteousness will appear to dispel gloom, oppression, and injustice. So if the fires of judgment are final, then so are the joys of salvation. The coming of the day of the Lord brings both and brings those who love God to be with him forever. Are you ready? This brings us on to the second point. Waiting on the day of the Lord. When is it coming? So when is this great and dreadful day happening? When should we expect it? Well, if we go back to chapter three of Malachi. The Lord says, as he does in chapter four, that he'll send a messenger before he comes. And in chapter four, he reveals a bit more. An Elijah figure. Elijah in the Old Testament brought the people to turn back to God. This figure will bring people to repentance, for hearts turn back. Or God will strike the land with, depending on your translation, either a curse or utter destruction. Well, Elijah in the Old Testament, because of him, no rain fell upon the land for years. There was drought and famine. It was cursed. So, God might strike the land with a curse or of utter destruction. And these are the final words of the Old Testament. What a cliffhanger. When is Freedom Day on July the 19th? Will England win the final tonight? Those cliffhangers are nothing compared to this. Because it's not two years or 55 years that people have had to wait on upon this cliffhanger. It's been 400 years. 400 years of silence between Malachi and the New Testament. It's only a page here, but it's 400 years of silence. 400 years of people going, will Elijah turn us back to God? Or will God strike us with destruction and curse us? Are we ready if he does show? Will he show? Why is it taking so long? And after a long period of waiting, Suddenly, unexpectedly, Elijah turns up. Luke's gospel starts with an angel appearing to Zechariah, saying to him, he will have a son, John, who will go on before the Lord 
in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And it's clear from the Gospels that John prepares the people for Jesus, the Lord. The Gospels proclaim that God has arrived in the flesh. Surely then, though, the day of the Lord has come and gone. But if that's true, then the wicked today are still very much present. And there is still injustice and oppression. Just turn on the news. But what's happened? Has the son of righteousness failed? Is it futile to serve God? Will evil do us just prosper? No. For Jesus the Lord doesn't just come once. The first time Jesus comes to bring salvation, and we know that for the Gospels, the crucifixion, the resurrection. But the second time, his second coming, when the day of the Lord will truly be fulfilled, this is when he'll judge. Jesus himself says in John 5 that he's been given all authority to judge and the time is coming when all will be judged. And some will rise to live and others will rise to be condemned. Those whose hearts turn and come to him, who turn to fear him, who honour his name, who revere his name, his treasure possession, he will be the son of righteousness and his faithful people will be spared based on what? Well, in 317 says this, based on his compassion. I'll spare them just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And those who don't, as Malachi states in this chapter, he will strike with a curse. They are doomed and their destiny is fire and stubble. His land is cursed and destined for utter destruction without a single root or branch left to them. But right now, we are placed between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. It's partially fulfilled and yet still to be. It's now and not yet. The day of the Lord has not yet set, but it has begun to rise. And Malachi is a warning for us to turn while there's still time. And that only the faithful will make it. It will be a time of horrible judgment, unlike no other for those against God, but for the faithful. It is beautiful and is glorious. But when? It's been over 2,000 years since Jesus first came. When is it? Well, the second coming is something that urges the New Testament. If you read it letter after letter, book after book, it's on their minds. And when is a question that the church constantly turns to. But the Bible doesn't tell us when the second coming will happen. But we know why it's taken so long. Peter tells us in his second letter, in chapter three, to ensure as many people as possible come to repentance, to receive salvation, rather than to perish. It is out of the kindness of God that we are waiting so long. But the New Testament writers also remind Christians that instead of worrying when this will happen, to focus on being prepared for when it does happen. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter warns, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. Why? As you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. For the faithful follower of Christ, this is glorious. And you turn with me to the final words of the Bible in Revelation 22. It says this. I am coming, says Lord Jesus. And the response is, Amen. 
come, Lord Jesus, in Revelation 22. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. But just as Jesus' first coming was unexpected and unguarded, so will be his second coming. Are you ready? Which brings us us to the final bit. Malachi 4, verse 4. I have not forgotten Malachi 4, verse 4. You might have thought I jumped, but I did not. I'll save it for the end. Because Malachi doesn't just focus on the future. In the centre of this chapter, we have this verse. And this verse is God herding his people back to the past. And it says this. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. This is the key to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Have you noticed in this final chapter, there's only one commandment and is this, remember. But this isn't simply a journey down memory lane where we say, oh, do you remember when? And that's it. No, this is not simply recalling something, but it's a call to action. How many of you, for example, would be pleased if you said to someone, remember the trash or take the bins out? Or remember, we're going walking tomorrow. And then that person recalled about the bins or going out with you. I did nothing about it. The bins are still there. The walk didn't happen. If they said, oh, yes, I remember you said that. You would be rightfully livid. Or imagine you said, remember, it's my birthday next week. Or honey, remember, it's our anniversary tomorrow. And your special day arrives and nothing happens and nobody does anything. Would you not be disappointed? Of course you would. Because by saying remember, you expect, you imply some kind of action. After all, what good is remembering the trash if the bins are left overflowing? Here, God is commanding his people to remember, to recall and take action the law of Moses, the decrees and laws that the Lord gave to Moses at Horeb. Where where is Horeb? Where is Mount Horeb? Well, it's often never termed for Mount Sinai. You know, the famous mountain in the desert where Moses is given the Ten Commandments as well as other laws. This was straight after God had saved them from the Egyptians, where God proclaimed they were his people, and where the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was truly born. This is when Israel became God's people. This was the foundation of the nation. Israel's identity was rooted in the Exodus event. At Mount Sinai was where, God taught, God, was where God told them they were his treasure possession, as we see in 317 in Malachi. It's where the, prom, the, the people promised they would do everything the Lord commanded them to do. Where before God gave them commandments, he declared that he was the one who saved them. And the commandments were for those who were his people. So God is saying through Malachi to his people then and to now, recall my word, recall our covenant and act upon it. This is still applicable today. God is saying that they've disconnected from their identity, their destiny and their God by going away from what God dictated. If you read the book of Malachi, have you noticed how many of the commandments have been broken? They commit adultery, they steal and rob, they misuse and blaspheme the name of the Lord, they serve other gods with idolatry, and so on and so on. God's people in Malachi's time have untethered themselves from the shore of his word and are drifting into a future shipwreck, going towards a fiery furnace. God, through Malachi, urges them to recall, turn, and then act accordingly, so that judgment is not condemnation, but rather a show of salvation. 
But Malachi's people do not deserve salvation. And nor do we. How different are we from the people of Malachi's day? Not a lot. If we truly examine ourselves by God's standards, we find ourselves wanting by a lot. We too are altogether compromised and half-hearted. Our hearts secretly pile accusations against God and our hearts are too fickle and disconnected. We pursue other gods all too eagerly. We do not deserve the salvation that God brings. Malachi tells his people to remember the law. We too need to remember. For God's people to remember that time and time again, they and we failed, even from the very beginning. And that's why we, every week in church, we confess and repent. For God's people need to remember how sinful they truly are, but also how compassionate God is. For didn't Christ come on the cross for us? Christ came to deal with our condemnation and wrath that God has put on us, to spare us out of compassion by going to the cross, to bring us to righteousness that doesn't burn like the furnace, but heals to a place and state of being of joy and peace. For Christ deals with our wickedness, our arrogance and our evil there and then on the cross and offers a place in the book of life that straw remembrance to all who believe and repent. So Christian, remember the commandments of God. Remember, Christian, your utter sin and failure leading to death. Remember, Christian, that Christ, who bought you salvation at such a high cost. Remember, Christian, the cross. And remember, Christian, the gospel. Where the new covenant, the New Testament was born. Where we became a people redeemed if we turn to him. Where our identity flows from the turning point that tethers us back to God, the one who saved us, we who could not save ourselves. For remembering the past, the cross and the saviour upon it is the only light, the only roadmap from which we can see the future with eager anticipation which is this, the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord is going to the cross. Are you ready? Well, as we finish the book of Malachi, we find that Malachi deals with a people who have turned away from God's covenant or have forgotten have forgotten so conveniently the parts which doesn't suit them. Because God's word isn't comfortable and isn't convenient. For them, times have changed, circumstances have changed, and culture has changed. Those were excuses back then, and those are excuses we often say now. Our people who are at best half-hearted, and have lost the sense of who God is. Does that sound all too familiar? It should. So how does God deal with the people who are willing to turn away from him? And those who wish to serve him who need reassurance? How does God humble the arrogant? How does he challenge the evildoers? And bring hope to those who are fearful of the future and encouraging faithfulness? How does God effectively silence his critics and show both his judgment on the wicked and salvation on those who fear and love him? By pointing to his inevitable coming, his inevitable coming of eternal ramifications. 
the day of the Lord. A day great and terrible of both judgment and salvation, where God's justice is fully realised and his people fully free. Where God fully follows through. So we've now finished the book of Malachi. We finished it. But where are you situated? Take a good look at yourself. Examine your heart. Do you fully revere, honour, love and fear the Lord? Are you ready for a second coming? If not, turn to him. Look and remember the cross. And if you are, remember the cross. Be ready and rejoice. In Malachi 4, God's final word for his people, then and now, is this. The day of the Lord is coming. So remember the Lord and be ready. The day of the Lord is coming. So remember the Lord and be ready. Are you ready? Let me pray briefly before we go back to Ian. Lord God, your coming is inevitable. It will happen and it will bring both judgment and salvation. Lord, help us if we have not already to turn to you or to turn back to you. To escape your judgment, but come to your salvation where there's joy and peace in you. Help us remember what you've done and what you ask us to do. Lord, Help us to go towards the sun of righteousness rather than the fiery furnace. And we thank you, Lord, that the second coming has been slow so that we can turn to you out of your compassionate salvation. Help us, Lord, to be ready. Amen. Ian, over to you. Mark, thank you so much for preaching to us faithfully. And let's sing together.
So, Mark, thank you so much for speaking faithfully to us, to warn us of what the Bible says God's judgment will be like. So we can be ready, so we can look to the cross and seek his forgiveness. And he reminded us of why we say the confession, because we are sinful and we need to come back and seek God's forgiveness. And so let's pray together, remembering our sin, and remembering a holy God, and remembering Jesus. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So Jesus Christ our Lord came from the Father, the Son of Righteousness, come to bring all God's righteousness and face the fire of God's judgment in our place so we can be forgiven absolutely everything and guaranteed our resurrection with him for eternity. Praise God that when we see the day of the Lord coming, we will be welcomed because we trust him. Let's pray together and Peter's going to lead us today. Lord, we begin this morning by thanking you for the promise we read from Malachi that for those who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go out and leap like calves released from the storm. We thank you, Lord, for those of us that trust in you, we have that promise. We know that in you and through you, we are coming home. So, Lord, it's in the confidence of that promise we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we begin by praying for ourselves because we know that whilst we can give thanks to that promise, it comes with a warning that for some, the coming of the Lord will be great and dreadful. So, Lord, we pray that you would help us to live lives that are worthy of the promise that we've received, so that through living those lives, we can reveal you. And also give us the confidence to share that good news, the good news of the joy that comes from putting our trust in you with those around us, so that other people might not see the coming of the Lord as being dreadful. But Lord, to know that putting our trust in you is better than all the things that we can put our trust in in the world, whether that's money or the good opinion of other people or whether or not we win football matches. Lord, we pray that we would help others to turn to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we thank you that as we pray for confidence for ourselves to share your good news, we know that we do that as part of a global church around the world that shares your good news with people across every nation. And we pray especially this morning for um, Diego Pacheca and his family in Chile. We thank you this week for the, the opportunity to hear from Helen uh, Crosslinks, Lord of um, Diego's work in the church there. And we continue to pray for them all, Lord. We know that in Chile they're not able to meet physically in church at, this, at the moment because of COVID. So, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen them. We ask that you would continue to pour out your spirit upon them and that they would remain close and faithful to you. We pray also for the counselling course that Diego will be starting soon. Lord, we pray that you would bless him in that and that you would bless his ministry as he moves into that work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, as we, we prayed for the church in Chile where they're not able to meet, we begin to think, Lord, about the, the preparations we're making to begin meeting in person again at the 10.30 service. Lord, over the next few weeks, we pray for the plastering work that continues and for the, the cleaning. Lord, we pray that all of that would be completed in time for us to start at the beginning of August. We pray especially, Lord, for all those that are involved in the, the other practicalities that will be required to make that happen. We pray especially for Stan and Pat as church wardens, for Tina and Chris 
as the deputy church wardens and all the, the team of side people that will be involved as we begin to, to get back to, to meeting normally together again. We pray that you would bless them. We thank you for their faithfulness in all the work that they do that is unseen so often, Lord. And we pray that as we, we do begin to, to meet together as we, as we used to, Lord, that you would bless them in the work that they do to make that possible for all of us. We also pray, Lord, for um, all those who are on the, the PCC who are continuing to uh, oversee the church and, and make those decisions about how we proceed, Lord. We pray that you would bless them. We thank you for their service, Lord, and ask that you would grant them wisdom in the decisions that they make. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for our nation. Lord, we pray for the preparations over the next week or so for the lifting of restrictions, Lord. We know that that's happening at a time when we, we do see increasing infections and there's there's news of, of more people going into hospital, Lord. So we pray for that whole situation, Lord. We pray that you would be with our nation as that happens and that it would go well. We pray for those that lead us, Lord. We pray that they would continue to make wise decisions, Lord, and that they would lead us well in the way that they they act, in the things that they say, Lord, as we, we move into this next phase, Lord, that you would help this nation to be led with integrity and that we would all continue to, to act in a responsible way. And we do pray, Lord, whether we're personally interested in the outcome or not, Lord, for the, the match tonight, Lord, we pray most of all that it would pass peacefully, Lord, that it would be something that people would enjoy and something that brings people together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our schools here in Kidsgrove. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities we have to minister to children, families and the staff in, in schools around Kidsgrove. We pray especially this week for Letty, for her work as the, the school's chaplain, Lord. We thank you for her. We thank you for her faithfulness in her ministry throughout this time, Lord. It's been so different from what she and, and we might have been expecting her to do, Lord in the, the way that the world has changed since she, she came to Kids Grave, Lord. We, we do thank you for her faithfulness in, in working through the, the circumstances that we face, Lord. And we pray as we, we come to the end of term that, as with all the, the pupils and teachers across the school, that you would grant her rest through the holidays, Lord. Help her to be refreshed during that time and help her to, to come back in September ready as we hope that, that things will be much more back to normal, Lord, ready to continue to serve you and continue to minister for you to students and teachers and families, Lord, that your kingdom might be revealed um, through the, the work we do in schools across Kids Grove. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, Lord, we think of those that we know individually that are in need of a special touch from you this morning, Lord, whether that's those that are sick, those who are anxious, those who are grieving or those who are facing difficult circumstances of any kind. In a moment of silence, we lift them up to you now. Lord, we thank you that you know every situation that we have lifted before you now. We thank you that you know what's needed and how best to work. So we ask that you would move in each of those situations and that you would be with those of us that are near to the people that need that touch from you, Lord. Help us to minister for you in those circumstances and that your will will be done. And gathering all our prayers this morning into one, we pray the prayer that our Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Peter, thank you for recording prayers for us. 
Well, as, as Peter prayed and I mentioned at the beginning of the service, you'll have picked up. We hope to start again in the church building next week, but that's not been possible. Unfortunately, the builders have had to go a couple of days over what they estimated, which has had a, a knock-on effect from other things like the cleaners we've booked in can't now come when we book them and they have to delay, delay us a couple of weeks. So the August the 1st will be the, the first time. Uh, for the 10.30 service, that will, we'll have an all-age service. We'll just have everybody who we can uh, get together We'll have to work out the restrictions, uh, which will be sensible at that time. We'll work all that out nearer the time, but uh, book August the 1st in. We will still be streaming. We have the cameras in church, so we'll be streaming uh, for those who can't make it or don't feel it's right to come back just yet. So there you go. August the 1st will be our Freedom Day as a church. Uh, progress on the building. Here we go. Here's the church building uh, as of Friday. Uh, all of the plastering on that side of the wall uh, room is finished. Uh, almost all on that side is finished. They've just got the last bit to do and then some clearing up and some woodwork to stick back up and, and things like that. So uh, almost there. Almost there. Thank you for your patience. And thank you for your giving. I don't quite know the latest total. The last time I knew it was over £9,000. So that is fantastic. Thank you so much for your generosity. It's not too late to give if you haven't yet. And if you haven't filled in the survey about returning, that would be really helpful, even if you're not certain about what you're going to do. If you can give us an indication, it'll help us work out how many people are going to turn up and how we uh, space everyone so we still have some sort of distance between us and just work all that out. So thank you. Uh, Zoom coffee in half an hour at 12 o'clock as usual. Um, the link, the Zoom link, is the one that we always use. Last week we had a different one, and I see someone's just joined that, ready and waiting. If you've just joined a Zoom uh, meeting, Brian, uh, it's the wrong one. Okay, you need to go to the one that was in the link on the email, the one that we always use. That's the Zoom copy for 12 o'clock. A final hymn together to look forward to Jesus' return. Consider all the words I enter. 
final prayer from the book of 1 Thessalonians. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always.